Last time we began talking about the difference between being safe and being dangerous. Just like I'm about ready to be dangerous to this microphone. (laughs) All right, so we asked the question, is dangerous the way we want to describe Jesus? And is dangerous the way we want to be described? The handy definition of dangerous is as follows. Dangerous, likely to cause harm, unsafe, perilous, full of risk, hazardous. And while Jesus and his followers are called to bring comfort and life to those who are broken, to those who are sick, to the poor, to the outcast, we are dangerous. We are dangerous to the patterns of this world. We are dangerous to the kingdom of this world. And we are dangerous to the prince of this world. And who is that? Yes, Satan. The enemy. Turn to Matthew chapter 21 as we recap from last time. Last time we looked at Jesus in a new light from the book of John. Uh, We saw him storm into the temple. We saw him overturn tables, scatter coins all over the place. And this is awesome. We saw Jesus create a whip from cords of leather. All right. Is this the Jesus you know? When you see pictures, what do you usually see? Jesus with little children on his knee, carrying a little lamb. Okay. Put another picture in your mental imagery here of creating a whip out of cords of leather. Okay. Forget Indiana Jones, we've got Indiana Jesus. All right? So interesting enough, last time we looked at John, now we're going to look at Matthew. He also has an account of this incident, and we're going to start in Matthew 21, like I said. Matthew 21, verse 12. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. He knocked over tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And then he said to them, The scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Why do you think Jesus was so angry? Yeah, that's, that's great. You put it in modern context. I mean, if we were here having a gathering and people were selling things downstairs and creating a ruckus, and he, we'd probably be angry too. Anyone else? Yeah, if it was our house, it's God's house, so if it was our house, we'd be angry. It's it's almost like Jesus was putting up a proverbial no soliciting sign. (laughs) Oh, yeah. The animals created a mess, yeah. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, that though, that's all right. That's all correct. Exactly. They were selling things for unfair prices. And that's exactly what I, w- I was going to get to. They were exchanging money. When you had to come, it's kind of like you had to get the temple money when you get there and you they had an exchange rate that you totally got gypped. You know, they were cheating people. And not only that, you know, people were coming to sacrifice and because they had traveled a long distance, they didn't bring their animals, they actually purchased animals there, but they, they purchased these animals for sacrifice at a super high cost. I mean, crazy. And so when you boil it down, all these things are right. But I think that Jesus 
was upset that the religious system that these religious leaders had set up was getting in the way of people being able to worship God. If you break it down to its basic level, Jesus gets upset when we get in the way of others being able to worship God. But Jesus' concern is always for people. The religious leaders allowed all these distractions and obstacles that prevented people from coming before God and making their sacrifice. And so what did Jesus do? Took an uncivilized approach with a divine boldness empowered by risk-taking faith. Those are the first three characteristics of a dangerous church that we covered last time. But what I like about Matthew's account of this incident is that it goes further. The next verse he says, or it says, the blind, this is right after he clears the temple, the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. What's this? Jesus goes berserk and now people are lining up to be healed. Isn't that kind of odd? He made a whip. If somebody made a whip and started driving out all these animals and throwing over tables, do you think you'd run to him for uh, healing? Of course you would. Again, stepping back for this, this is what I think. First of all, I think they recognized the authority of Jesus. He came in there and they realized or they felt that he had authority to do this. And it was only after the distractions and the obstacles were removed that Jesus began healing people. It was only then that they could encounter the fullness of the divine Christ. It was as if the temple had finally been freed to be what God meant it to be. A place for people to encounter God firsthand and to experience healing of the broken things in their lives. So was Jesus dangerous? Let's look at the next two verses. The leading priest and the teachers of the religious law saw these wonderful miracles. I love that. It's wonderful miracles. And they heard even the children in the temple shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. And their response but the leaders were indignant. The religious leaders were indignant. What does that mean? They felt outraged, incensed, offended, insulted. They saw Jesus as dangerous to their way of life. And it's why they ultimately conspired to have Jesus put to death on a cross. And so what we see is that these leaders, their focus was on themselves. They had a me attitude. Where was Jesus' focus? Others. He had a we attitude, from me to we. A safe church is made up of people who play it safe and are self-focused. A dangerous church is made up of people who are learning to be outward-focused and are learning how to take bold faith risks with God. Let's watch this. It's a humorous video about a self-focused church. Imagine a church where every member is passionately, wholeheartedly, and recklessly calling the shots. I have a busy work week, and by the time Sunday rolls around, I'm tired. So how about a church service that starts when I get there? Can do. When you arrive, we begin. This guy, he plays by his own rules. We want to find a church where if he starts screaming, we're not the bad guys. Say no more. If your baby's screaming, you stay seated. The others around you can leave. You know, financially, Sherry and I don't give a lot to the church, but we'd sure like to know who does. All right, if you join now, you'll know what every person gives in detail. When I'm in the church service, can my car get a buff and a wax? Not just that, but an oil change and a tune-up. Hey, how about tickets to the Super Bowl? That's asking too much. I'm serious. If I'm going to join, I want tickets to the big game. All right, you join now, and we'll get you there. I like a pony. Look in your backyard. (laughs) Me Church, where it's all about you. That's an awesome video. Okay, that seems pretty ridiculous, doesn't it? 
But at the same time, you know, it is an exaggeration of a true reality that many of us are focused more on our needs than the needs of others. More focused on what we want than what God would want for us. I suggest that it's time for us to move from me to we. The first three characteristics that we covered last time about a dangerous church, they were inward, an uncivilized approach, a divine boldness, and a risk-taking faith. They start with me, and they reflect an inward change. And it's not a bad me, it's, it's where we need to start. But the three characteristics that we're talking about today, they're outward. They help us move, they help us move from me to we. So number four, good, I always like to count my fingers, make sure I'm holding up the right number. A dangerous church possesses an unshakable devotion. It's made up of people like you and I who have been with Jesus and have an unordinary love for God. Okay, let's look at the devotion of the apostles in Acts 5. It says, they, the Jewish council basically, the Jewish council called in the apostles and had them flogged. Then they ordered them, they ordered the apostles never again to speak in the name of Jesus. And then they let them go. The apostles, and this is the interesting part, the apostles left the high council rejoicing. Remember they had been flogged? They left rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer the disgrace for the name of Jesus. Awesome. Yeah. That is a super challenging picture of devotion to Christ. But what we see is that the early disciples, they were sold out to God. They were all in. This is a reminder that it's time to stop observing and to start participating. It's time to move from me to we, from being consumers of faith to taking an active part in God's kingdom. Let's look at number five. A dangerous church has a sense of selfless community. Now, selfless, it speaks of not being selfish, not focused on self-benefit, self-gain, or self-promotion. Selfless. A lot of people think that the church is here for us, for themselves. They see the church as a place to have their needs met, and we've forgotten that we are the church and we are here for others. A dangerous church is made up of ordinary people like you and I who have encountered God firsthand and are sold out to Him. And here's how Acts 4, still those early believers, this is how they describe the early church. Verse 32, All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them. And there were no needy people among them, because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Wow. It's a challenge. But the world, people, in our community, in our very community, are looking for a place Or more accurately, they're looking for a people who live in Christ. And when they see Jesus lived out in our faith community, they are drawn to him. They are drawn to him. Jesus said, I will draw all people to myself. It's time we move from me to we, from a self-concern to building deep relationships with others in our faith community, so that the world can see the unconditional love of Christ. Six, a dangerous church has a consuming focus. And by consuming focus, I'm talking about who we are, what we're about, the essence of our life. The early church said, lock us up, beat us, even kill us. We have seen God and you cannot stop us. 
They had a consuming focus, as seen again in Acts 5. We read the first part of this. Remember the apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus? And it goes on. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they continued to preach and teach this message. Jesus is the Messiah. Consuming focus. Again, the dangerous church is made up of ordinary people like like you and I who have seen God and cannot stop sharing everything they have seen and heard. Being a disciple, being a follower of Jesus is not just something we believe. It's inherent in the way we live and even what we die for. At work, at school, in the grocery store, at Pizza Hut, on the road... I am a minister of Christ. But it's time for us to realize that this is true for each one of us. It's time to move from me to we. From a self-focus to being united together and taking an active role in the consuming focus of God's mission. So let me ask a question. What is our consuming focus at encounter. Quite simply, all that we are is a burning bush, and all that we do is we seek to help people encounter God, experience community, and engage culture. It's all for one purpose. Quite simply, we want to see people move forward toward a relationship with Jesus. We want to see people move forward toward a relationship with Jesus. I'm going to say it again. If you guys could say it with me. We want to see people Move forward toward a relationship with Jesus. That means no matter where somebody is, they're an atheist, they're a skeptic, they're a new believer, wherever they are, they can move forward from where they are now. They can move one step closer. When we serve the community, when we're giving Tootsie Pops out on the uh, walking mall, when we're at the park having a concert, when we're at the fall fest or the spring fest that's coming up, We have an opportunity to show people Jesus through our lives and to help them move forward towards that relationship. Maybe invite them here. Maybe invite them just for dinner or coffee. Again, we want to move from me to we in several contexts. One, moving from me to we means moving from being consumers of faith to taking an active part in God's kingdom. What does that mean practically? Be a part of the worship gatherings. Yes, attend, but serve in an area. Work together to make the gathering an authentic, unique, relational, and welcoming experience. One where we can find something more meaningful and distinctly different than what the world offers. And most importantly, something we can be excited about. Number two, moving from me to we means moving from a self-focus to building deep relationships with others within our faith community. Basically, join a life group. We have them alternating Sundays with the worship gathering. In fact, we're having one next Sunday. It's an awesome opportunity to build deeper relationships, to grow spiritually together. We want to do more than just meet periodically. We want to get to know each other, build friendships, and do life together. Finally, three, moving from me to we means moving from the pastor, seeing the pastor as a hired minister, to each person taking on an active role within the ministry of God. That means we're going to serve others in our community, but also in our everyday life. We're going to be there to serve needs and bless our community, but to reach out, let them know we care. And as individuals, we are called to build authentic relationships that can lead to spiritual conversations, to faith discussions. And we do that by demonstrating the unconditional love of Jesus. So let's go back, back to when we were talking about when Jesus cleared the temple. When he overturned tables and drove the animals out with the whip he made from cords of leather. And do you remember what happened after? They came to get healed, yes. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. We see that his... Jesus cleared the temple. He also restored it. He restored it to what God meant it to be, a place for people to encounter God firsthand and to experience healing of the broken things of their lives. 
Let me ask one last question. Where is the temple today? Side of us. How do we know that? 1 Corinthians 3.16, this is Paul talking. He says, Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? That means that you are a place. You are a vessel through which people can encounter God firsthand. In you, the power of Jesus in your life, if you're a believer, the power of Jesus in your life, people can experience the healing of the broken things in theirs. God says in Malachi 1.10, How I wish one of you would shut the temple doors so that these worthless sacrifices could not be offered. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of heaven's armies, and I will not accept your offerings. Basically, God would rather have no sacrifices than worthless sacrifices. He desires for us to be sold out for him. He desires for us to be all in. So is it possible that you, God's temple, need a cleaning? Is it possible that if Jesus could enter the temple of your heart, would he begin overturning tables and driving out things that shouldn't be there? Is it possible that you and I have been self-focused? That we've been focused on me instead of we and so offered worthless sacrifices? If so, it's time to change. Let's pray. Lord Father, Jesus came to earth to offer a relationship with God. He demonstrated for us a selfless love and died on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. If you do not have a personal relationship with God, this is your opportunity. This may be a time to move from safe to dangerous, to move from me to we. Are you ready to turn away from the life that you have now? Repent of your sins, receive Jesus as Savior, and fully devote yourself to God and say that you are all in. If so, God says welcome to the dangerous church.